All right, welcome to Flute Espresso. So we are live with Allison Fierce, Associate Principal Flutist of the New York Philharmonic. Allison, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so excited to have you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so we usually get started by um, just kind of discussing what are you drinking in your flute, spress, flute specialist mug? <laughs> in my flute specialist mug, I made myself a matcha latte. <laughs> oh, so good. <laughs> not coffee, but close enough. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yep, coffee, tea, matcha latte, anything goes. That's awesome. <laughs> I am being boring. I'm just drinking regular coffee, but matcha latte yeah. sounds. <laughs> so what kind of things have you been up to during uh, the pandemic? Have you started any new hobbies, new projects, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had so much time apart from working, right? It's been almost a year since we shut down. Um, I mean, we're slowly getting back to work now, of course. Um, when the pandemic first started, I definitely took a, a sizable break <laughs> from playing the flute, uh, mm -hmm. as I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, but so they got back to practicing and I've actually picked up a few hobbies. Um, so my partner, he's Chinese. So I've been taking Chinese lessons. I'm learning how to speak Mandarin, which is proving to be pretty difficult, but also uh, very, very interesting and fun. Um, and I've also been playing tennis a lot. <laughs> uh, so those are, those are my two new acquired skills during, during the pandemic, in addition to flute playing. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's so awesome mm -hmm. to explore new hobbies, especially new languages as well. Yeah, yeah. And when we have, you know, the time to, I'm very lucky to, to have this kind of time to explore my other interests as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just so important to do that in addition to flute playing. That's definitely yeah. the silver lining of the pandemic, I think, mm -hmm. to have time to explore different interests in addition to obviously playing the flute as well. Awesome. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So definitely. have you been doing like, Anything else, um, Any working on any exciting repertoire lately? Um, you know, I think, I mean, this is probably true for a lot of people. When I when I first started playing and after my, my long break, I kind of started at the beginning, like fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I had to, tried to build that back up while I had this, this amount of time to do so because when, you know, we're working in normal capacity, it's just learning a lot of new repertoire, especially for me, since I'm I'm still young and I'm still um, like new to this career, I don't I don't know all of the repertoire yet. Mm -hmm. It's very rare for me to come back to a piece saying like, oh, I played this before. It's like I'm just revisiting it. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of um, learning new things on the job. So that took a lot of my time. Um, so having having this kind of break to to go back, practice a lot of my scales, arpeggios, thirds, all of this, all of this kind of exploration has has been really rewarding for me. Um, so yeah, I've been working a lot on that. And now we're getting back to, to recording sessions. So learning that rep is also on my stand as well. <laughs> awesome, that's so cool. So you've been successful at so many orchestral auditions. So I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, uh, what is your orchestral audition preparation routine look like? Sure, yeah, that's, I mean, that's such a good question, right? And everyone, everyone is different on this topic. Yeah. But I, my audition life hasn't been too, too long. I think I've only taken a handful of this. I've, I've been very lucky at New York Phil, I think was either my fourth or fifth audition that I've ever taken. Um, and then before New York Phil, I was second flute in the Rochester Symphony Orchestra, which was also a really, really great. I'm so thankful for my time there having that to have been my first professional experience. Um, so I, I've won those two auditions and what I learned in between both of them, uh, I, I learned a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, yeah. So I was juggling a lot of different auditions while I was still in Rochester. I was taking auditions for Second Fluid, I was taking auditions for different orchestras for Associate Principal and then obviously the New York Phil one um, while having my job in Rochester and having rehearsals and concerts. Um, so the the biggest key takeaway for me was organization. I need to yeah. be super, super organized with my time. Um, so I kind of developed this rotational schedule. Um, so basically I split, depending on how much repertoire I need to be learning and for these auditions, like when you get the audition packet, it's like a book, you know? <laughs> like I have actually, I have right here on my music stand, this is, 
the binder that I use for my New York presentation with like all of the parts in it and like all of the different tabs. Um, and it's just a huge amount of repertoire. So I had to be uh, very organized with my time. So I made this rotational schedule, which I think was either three or four days long. I would say like day A, day B, day C. Um, and I would do a pared down version of my daily technique exercises because I didn't want to be spending, you know, two hours on technique because then it's not enough time to get through all of the repertoire. Um, and then I kind of grouped, grouped the excerpts in a certain way um, that, you know, I wouldn't want to play, you know, all of my Brahms excerpts on the same day, or I wouldn't want to play like all of the excerpts from Beethoven Leonor on the same day. Um, so I kind of spaced them out uh, to have a good a good mix every day. And I would only, I think I would only practice each excerpt for about 15 minutes. I would set a timer um, because I was playing, I don't even know, like six to eight excerpts every day, which is around like two hours of practice just for that. Um, and I would set a timer on my phone at the beginning of the 15 minutes, I would record the excerpt or record a portion of the excerpt um, just to see where I was at. And then I would only pick one thing uh, to improve that day because that's something I learned as well. I can't, uh, well, I, I don't think it's a good idea to see an excerpt and be like, okay, I'm gonna practice it until it's perfect now. <laughs> I think it's so much more beneficial to just pick one spot. So for example, if I was practicing deafness, I would only work on for 15 minutes the opening scale, you know, something like this. Um, and having this kind of compound knowledge when you revisit the excerpt so many different times mm -hmm. uh, leads to having a really in-depth understanding of what you want to do with the excerpt. And I think it's kind of like a roadmap, like every single portion, every single measure of the excerpt is accounted for um, and really ingrained <laughs> at the, the end of your practice time. So that's, that's how I would structure it. I would do my daily technique and sometimes I would even like just go to rehearsal and then I wouldn't do my technique because I'd be like, okay, I've already warmed up now. <laughs> so yeah. then I got to get to the excerpt because I just I didn't have the time mm -hmm. uh, in the day. And also I didn't want to play too, too much because I didn't want to, you know, injure myself or get tired or I was really, really careful uh, about that. And then also I think um, apart from that, I also made a list of excerpts that I would listen to at night. So I think it's very important to uh, practice away from your instrument as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I would say, oh, this week I'm going to listen to, you know, Daphne and Chloe tonight. I'm gonna to listen to Brahms Fourth Symphony tomorrow night just to get an overall uh, idea of the entirety of the piece, right? Because that's what uh, some of these auditions, they give you just the excerpt or they just list the piece. So you have to print out the entire, you know, flute part and be be prepared for anything anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I would say that that generally so preparation, being organized, having a set, you know, to do list. And it, it's nice too because once you're done with your to do list, you're uh, confident, like, oh, okay, I put my work in today so I can put my food away and I'm done practicing for the day. Instead of just like this open-ended kind of, you have this mound of repertoire to get through and you feel so overwhelmed uh, when you kind of put it in that perspective, it's it's a lot more manageable. Yeah. Um, and then listening work too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That is such great advice. Like I want to go back and listen to this and take notes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's so good. And mm -hmm. I was also wondering, so since you were already playing in an orchestra and while practicing excerpts, did the orchestral experience, um, like frequently going to our orchestra rehearsals and everything, did that make the excerpt practicing process easier or was it more difficult because the repertoire was different? Um, I mean, whenever you have experience in an orchestra already, <laughs> I think that makes the process of like doing your trial week easier because you already have this, you know, kind of experience. Yeah. I don't think that you need to have a job to have that experience. I found that doing a summer music festival is really similar to the kind of workload that you have on the job, right? Because you're playing a uh, different repertoire every week. It's, it's, it's very different than, I remember like playing in orchestra in college because you rehearse, you know, a few times a week for, 
a few weeks and then you play like one or two concerts right <laughs> and and here now we have like three rehearsals and then like three concerts every week and mm-hmm. a different repertoire so i guess that's that's kind of the first half of the question um but i also think it's challenging because you're playing such different repertoire um on your job mm-hmm. i was playing such different repertoire and i had to constantly switch between between all of these different pieces um when I would go to my practice, sometimes it, it overlapped. In one instance, um, we were playing Rite of Spring in Rochester, and the Rite of Spring Alpha Food part was on my New York Phil audition. So I, I had asked the principal food, Rebecca Gilbert, I was like, can I play alto food on this? Because I was second food, and I was, just, I was like, this is on the audition, and I really want the experience of playing it in the orchestra. So that, that was nice because I was practicing it anyway. <laughs> and I got to, I got to apply it, uh, which is, turned out to be a very good idea um so so yeah kind of yes and no i would say (laughs) yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense because also when you have the opportunity to play the um pieces that we have standard excerpts from in context i'm sure that that makes it so much easier very helpful (laughs) yeah Yeah. and i think it's also it's good to say that a lot of my practice i would actually do with like putting headphones on and listening to recordings and then playing along with a part uh and sometimes sometimes it's difficult um i taught a class yesterday on afternoon of a fawn and like that people play that so so differently so that's hard to, yeah. to kind of play with the recording but more and more standardized things like leonor which are i think that it's really helpful to to really get it in your ears too and especially for excerpts like like if I was playing, you know, Kinderman's Symphonic Metamorphosis, or if I was playing uh, William Tell, things like that, where you need to have other parts of the orchestra really ingrained uh, yeah. in, in your brains and like hear it while you're playing it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's very beneficial to play with recordings and headphones on. Yeah, it makes it more fun too. And for those yeah, who don't know, um, Allison and I actually went to school together for a brief mm-hmm. time before she won her first job. I had the privilege of sitting in the section with her when she played the Hindemith symphonic <laughs> and I just remember just being blown away you oh, said, thank you yeah, good yeah that <laughs> was so, so much fun yeah yeah mm-hmm. it was just such an inspirational experience to just <laughs> sit with you and play with you on that so <laughs> awesome <laughs> all right so we have another question from one of our viewers and mm-hmm. is what was your final round audition experience like before winning your New York Phil position Sure, yeah. Well, the whole experience of an orchestral audition is very, very long and tiring, but also, you know, it's it's an amazing, amazing experience because, you know, you get to play on the stage in front of all of these really wonderful musicians. Um, I guess I'll talk about two different parts because in my specific audition, we had a final round and then we had a super final round after that. Yeah. Um, so for my final round, um, we had to play a lot of repertoire. I think I played for about 40 minutes or so. <laughs> um, and we we had to play, you know, Mozart concerto with piano. We had a, a rehearsal with a pianist. And actually, if I could just tell a quick story on this too, right. I, I had a rehearsal with the pianist for the audition set at eight o'clock in the morning in New York. And I had to commute from New Jersey because I was staying with my parents at home. And it takes about like two, two and a half hours from that because I live at the Jersey Shore for me to get to New York. Uh, so I woke up at like 5 a.m. <laughs> and I left to go do my rehearsal with the pianist at 8 a.m. And then the final round started at noon. So I was just like hanging around New York for a few hours. Um, had my final round, I think I was third out of five people. So they put you in uh, individual dressing rooms at that point. So I was just sitting there for, you know, like an hour and a half-ish, uh, just waiting for my turn. Um, and mind you, I saw everyone else who was in the audition who are all amazing, amazing, really, really talented flutists. Um, and I just felt lucky to, to be there with them. Um, and so we played Mozart Concerto with the pianist. Uh, we played uh, an Esco Cantabile in Presto with a pianist. And then I, I don't remember how many excerpts. I want to say it was like seven or eight excerpts after that. So the whole thing was like 40 minutes long. And I remember all of the excerpts were going really well. And the last excerpt I had to play was Firebird. And I remember I like messed up a little bit in the second half of Firebird. <laughs> and I thought, I'm oh my God, it was sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, at the end of it, I was like, okay. I mean, something always happens, right? Uh, and I, but I went off, went back to my dressing room, and then I had to wait a little bit longer. Um, and we had had repertoire already in front of us for a super final round, so I knew that there was going to be a super final round. And yeah. I think it's it's important. I mean, just general advice: if you take an audition, uh, everything is so subjective. So even if you think that maybe you played bad, like someone else could think you played well, or if you think you played well, someone else could not like it that much. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's it's very important to whenever you complete a round to go with the mentality that you're going to the next round. So like stay in the zone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's, that's exactly what I did in my dressing room. I was like, well, I'm gonna go to Super Finals and let me, you know, get this music out and start getting into into that uh, environment. And um, and lo and behold, uh, the personal manager came in and said that myself and one other person were going to a Super Final round. Um, and at that point, that's when I had the first realization that like, oh, I might actually win this job. <laughs> That is so <laughs> amazing. This, this could actually happen now. And it's funny because the repertoire, um, like I mentioned earlier, the repertoire for the super final round was Rite of Spring on alto flute and sight reading. So, and if you know me, I love playing alto flute. I like, I'm such a low register, like flutist. Like, I really love uh, the, the lower notes. So I, I think my playing translates that translates to alto flute very easily um so i was just i was just excited <laughs> for this spring because i kind of i was like i got this you know yeah um, and then once i got on stage the the sight reading excerpts for the super final round were from shostakovich five uh which i mean i i had learned before prior to that obviously it wasn't on our list because it's sight reading um but it was so special for me because personally i listened to the the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra recording of Shostakovich Five like every other week because I think it's like the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. Rona McGee playing those those excerpts, those solos, and also the the orchestra. It's just oh, so so amazing. Would definitely go listen to that. Um, so those excerpts just came really naturally to me as well because I was so inspired uh, through the recording. Um, anyway, so I think at that point. I kind of felt like it was just like meant to be. You know? yeah, <laughs> like I, I wasn't super nervous at the super final round, which I thought was very surprising because auditions are very nerve wracking. I was just kind of like, yeah. like, yeah, I'm just playing music that I love to play. Um, and then once I got back to my, my dressing room before I even put all of my flutes away, the personal manager came in and said, well, we're offering you a trial. And and that was that. And yeah, so it, was, it was really, really amazing. I mean, very, very tiring process but <laughs> rewarding absolutely rewarding so yeah that's amazing well congratulations again and it's yeah no thank you so amazing to watch the things that you're doing with the new york phil too and so before the pandemic happened i guess what were a few like of your favorite performances that you had with them sure i mean I have to say my my trial week was definitely I mean frightening but also amazing. I played a yeah. uh, principal flute on uh Beast of an Eroica, oh, wow. um, which like going from playing second flute to then suddenly being principal flute on Beast of an Eroica in New York Philharmonic was like <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that's a big um, deal. That's awesome. <laughs> I, that piece so I think I know it like as well as the back of my hand right now. Yeah, okay. um, so that that was really, really incredible. Um, and then we we took that piece on tour. So I, I actually went uh, with the New York Philharmonic to China and played it there as well, which was really, really incredible as well. Um, and then apart from that, uh, probably another one of my favorite concert experiences was I got to play principal flute on Dvorak 9 with Gustavo Dudamel conducting. That was, you know, really, really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't even imagine. That sounds incredible. <laughs> That's so awesome. So another question we have, and I'm sure so many people listening are dying to know is, what advice do you have for flutists wanting to pursue a career as an orchestral musician? And I know the times are a little different right now, but orchestras yeah. will come back <laughs> and auditions yeah, will come back. Definitely. Orchestras will come back and auditions will come back. Absolutely. Um, general advice that I have, I mean, going back, going back to my time in Rochester, if I can just share a story. Um, 
these, I had two auditions before my New York Phil audition that I took place in while I was in Rochester. And they were at two bigger orchestras in the United States as well. Um, and I didn't make it to the final round of either audition. And I was very, very frustrated about it <laughs> because I, I knew that um, I was playing, you know, to the best of my ability, I was playing the excerpts the, the way that I wanted to play the excerpts. Um, and it, it was just frustrating. It kind of felt that everything was just kind of up in the air. It was kind yeah. of luck, right? Um, so I, I distinctly remember a phone conversation that I had with my my teacher from my undergraduate degree, Alberto Almarza, mm -hmm. um, just explaining my my frustrations with him. I was like, I don't I don't know what what could I be doing differently, you know? Um, and he was just kind of like, Allison, you're an incredible flutist. You just have to wait for the right panel. Yeah. Um, and that really inspired me because it it kind of shifted the perspective for me because I started thinking. Um, that like I'm developing into the musician that I want to become and going into an audition isn't this kind of competitive environment. I feel like sometimes uh, when you go, you know, into a conservatory or you go into these auditions, there's a lot of competitive tension. And, you know, if someone goes before you who's really amazing, you're like, oh, well, I that's bad luck because they're so amazing. Like, and I, I, I kind of uh, stopped thinking that way. You know, I think that um, anyone else's success doesn't doesn't take away from your opportunity um, and you really just have to focus on becoming who you want to be and developing yourself as a musician and it, in turn when I walked into this New York Phil audition I stopped thinking that I need to you know prove something like I need to impress people because when you do that I feel like you play a little defensively. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that uh, in order to win an audition, you have to play offensively, not like offensively, but like, you know, you have to, you have to play out, you know, and, yeah. and really, really, really show yourself and show that you are confident in who you are as a person. Um, so it, it was that, that kind of mentality shift that I think is the, the best advice that I can give because it made the world of a difference. You know, I don't think it's coincidence that I, I had this realization um, that I really thought when I walked onto the stage, I had a little mantra for myself. I was like, you know, it's the committee's opportunity to see, you know, the value in me as a player instead of my opportunity to impress everyone on that panel. Um, and when you think like this, I think that you end up in the place where you're supposed to end up. <laughs> so, because I know some people talk about, oh, well, so-and-so teacher at this school likes it this way, so I'm gonna change and do it this way. Or like this orchestra plays this way, so I'm going to, when I'm auditioning, I'm gonna do this. Sure. Um, and I think when you do that, if, if you do get the job or get into the school, uh, you're gonna have to keep up that persona, you know what I mean? And you're not gonna feel uh, super, super comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, or you're gonna have like an identity crisis, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it, it goes to show that I think that, you know, if you just put the work in yourself and you really, really develop into the musician that you wanna become, I think everything works out in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's such great advice. And I'm sure that helps a lot with performance anxiety too. And just mm -hmm. having that sense of confidence and just being really true to yourself when you enter any audition, I'm sure yeah. really helps mm -hmm. Time, um, and it's, it's hard to get to get to that point, right? Yeah. I think you yeah. kind of need uh, to have those little little setbacks, you know, a little a little yeah. trickle of failure here and there to to really yeah. use your humility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, and then it's hard not to let that get to you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If it happens yeah. more than once in like a short period of time, it's really hard yeah. to just maintain mm -hmm. that that confidence about it, but. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Awesome. And then, so our final question before we enter a speed round is, how do you keep orchestral excerpts fresh and avoid burnout on them? And that's partially um, something that I'm really curious to know too. Interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's such a good question. Um, I think like, Tactically, I think that when when you take different auditions and you're returning to these excerpts, I always think that it's a good idea to print like a fresh sheet of paper with the excerpt with like no other markings on it. Um, because for me, if I open up my like book that I studied from in college, I would just see 
all of those markings and things that I thought about when I was a student, because then it kind of puts me yes. in that in that mindset. Um, so I think that's kind of nice having having a blank slate uh, every time you uh, take a new audition and just like see the excerpt with no markings for the first time again and kind of develop um, new ideas. They don't have to necessarily be new, but I think naturally that allows you to filter out some things that maybe didn't work before um, and to come up with new ideas maybe uh, once you really start really start practicing it. It goes the same for pieces as well. I actually, I just reordered uh, the Chantolinos because oh, my Chantolinos yeah. from college is like, absolutely torn to shreds and has so much markings on it. I was I was looking back through it and I was like, I can't read from this. So I just ordered a whole new part. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I I can relate to that. My dad yeah. Chloe excerpt specifically, I cannot even read it because there's so yeah. many pencil markings mm -hmm. on my Mozart. Someone actually commented one time, did that get eaten by a dog or something? <laughs> so, <laughs> on it. so I know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome advice. All right, shall we go into the speed round? <laughs> this is a tradition. Uh, so it's a series of really short this or that questions. You can always pass at any time. Um, mm -hmm. We have about 10 of them and just answer like as quickly as possible. Don't think about it too much. <laughs> so first one, dogs or cats? Cat. I have a cat. <laughs> That's what His I name is Tango. Been. He's very cute. He's a very large orange cat. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he was hanging out with us earlier, right? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Solo music or orchestral excerpts? Oh, orchestral <laughs> excerpts, of course. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Iber or Nielsen? Either. I've actually never played Nielsen. <laughs> oh my gosh, I thought it was the only one. <laughs> I feel like I don't tell people that because they give me weird looks. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Same here. You could say that I haven't done it. I've yeah. I know it's been on my to-do list, but I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is a great when I have a second, I can all learn it. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I think I might know the answer that you're going to yeah. say. Petrushka or Rite of Spring? Oh, right of spring. Yeah. Because it, I mean, now it, it has a significant part of, you know, it's a special meaning to me. So, yeah. Because it was in the final round or super final round of my audition. So that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, coffee or tea? I prefer tea. I mean, I'm drinking green tea right now. So awesome. That's cool. Do you have a favorite kind of tea? Um, I, I make matches probably nearly every morning. <laughs> So when I when I'm playing with the orchestra though, I like to lay off the caffeine because I have a lot of natural energy <laughs> when I'm nervous. So. Makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Um, beach or mountains? Uh, beach. I grew up at the beach in New Jersey. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, opera or Broadway? Opera. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, uh, have you played much in operas? No, I, I haven't. I, I mean, I love playing, um, like, the. I mean, if you have, like, the opera excerpt book, I love, there's some, some melodies that are just so, so beautiful. And then all of the, you know, kind of Fantasia repertoire that we have, like, I think I just ordered the Mignon Fantasy, um, and it's so, so much fun to play. So, yeah, maybe in a different life, I could have been an opera singer. But yeah. I can't, so. <laughs> That's so cool. And, and singers and flutists, you have a lot of similarities. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay, um, are you a morning or an evening person? Definitely a morning person. Morning person, morning practicer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been getting that way too. Yeah. I'm so tired by the evening. I can't do anything. <laughs> okay, um, Chantalinos or Prokofiev Sonata? Uh, probably both. <laughs> sure. I like, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I would take both to like a deserted island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would keep you busy, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <The repertoire. laughs> okay, um, Upper West Side or Upper East Side? Oh, <laughs> Upper West Side, of course. Lincoln Center is an Upper West Side. <laughs> <laughs> it's our home. And this is um, an MSM specific question for any Ooh, okay. MSMers out there listening. Toaster Craftsman. <laughs> oh, wait, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I wasn't there long enough. <laughs> okay. Like the, the, the bar that's my MSM. No, restaurant. 
<laughs> I don't know the other one. <laughs> concerts, yeah. <laughs> I only played one concert in episode. <laughs> oh, I forgot. <laughs> but I thought you'd went to both. All right. Well, you can pass. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, it was so great talking to you today. So I guess we can finish up. Is there any last pieces of advice you want to give anyone? Or um, do you have any upcoming projects you're working on? Where can people find you? Um, last piece of advice. I don't know. I think I, I pretty I pretty much summed it up well before that. It's, you know, I think that people need to remember that we're in such a subjective career and that at the end of the day, we're artists and we're, you know, making music to, to evoke emotion, you know, we're trying to make people feel something. It's not this, this big competitive sport um, because it's so subjective. It's not like we're, you're running an Olympic race where someone comes in first and that's because they're the fastest, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, other things that come into play. So the only thing you can, you know, control is what you do. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, that would be my advice. And then I guess where you can find me at my website, AllisonPierce.com. I'm also teaching on play with a pro. If you, ever want to take a lesson with me preparing for competitions auditions you know any repertoire uh yeah so you can find me there awesome great well thank you so much so well, I guess thank you for having me yeah of course yeah it was great to talk with you and um we will see you all next time on the next episode of Espresso. perfect thanks again <laughs> you're welcome